this might be surprising to you, but most campaign most campaigns I interact with don't have campaign plans. They have vague ideas of what they want to do. They'll say, oh, we want to do this and we want to knock on some doors and we want to send some mail and we want to raise this amount of money. And I'm like, great, does it fit together? Is there a plan? Is there something together? And they'll say, oh, you know, I sort of like, no, that's not a plan. Having some ideas in your head is not a plan, right? A plan is something that you can look back on. It's something that you can refine. It is written down. Hey, I'm Scott, NDTC's video producer and strategist. Thank you so much for your interest in this training. If you find it helpful, please hit that like and subscribe button, as well as sign up for more free expert-led training at traindemocrats.org. Also, feel free to leave us a comment. We really just, we love and appreciate any feedback you want to share with us. So with that, I hope you enjoy the training. My name is Jordan Berg Powers. I use he, him, and I am executive director of Mass Alliance. Uh, <clears throat> so in my day job, Mass Alliance is a coalition of 28 progressive political organizations. We work to elect progressives to the state house and state senate here in Massachusetts. Um, we have a plethora of of organizations from sizes. We have teachers unions, we have smaller organizations, uh, and I get the pleasure of helping guide those work, guide their legislative work, and ultimately work on elections um, for, our, for, for them to help elect more progressives. Additionally, um, before I became at Mass Alliance, I was uh, I worked on congressional campaigns. I worked on Senate campaigns. I did a small stint on a presidential campaign. So no matter what level of government you are running for, I have had the pleasure of working on that level of race. So it can be really tiny. I've done like really tiny races. Massachusetts elects just about everything. And I've helped work on those races all the way up to presidential. I've done some of that work. So I'm really glad that you're joining us today to talk about how to build and use your campaign plan because this is something that I come across all the time in my day job, just like a need for a real campaign plan. And it's not always there and available. So we're going to walk you through it and we're going to make sure that you that you have it ready to go so that you're keyed um, and ready to win your election. So our objectives for this, uh, for this training are to define what a campaign plan is, to identify the components needed to build a campaign plan, and to recognize the importance of consistently revisiting your plan throughout the campaign. So if I do my job right, you will walk away with having been touched by all three of these objectives, defining what your campaign plan is, identifying the components of a campaign plan and what's needed, and to recognize the importance of revisiting your campaign plan. Every campaign plan, the first thing you need to know is that all campaigns have lim have limited, um, there are limited things that limit your ability to do the things you want to do. So the first is people, right? Good campaigns, good campaigns, they build the number of people who are on a campaign. If you're running a strong grassroots campaign, the thing I love about campaigns is that the people who you started with aren't going to be the only people you know. On the end, on a good campaign, on election day, I look around a room and there are all these people who I've never met before this campaign and probably wouldn't have met were it not for this campaign in this location. So it's the great thing about campaigning is the ability to meet and be a part and learn from all these new people who come into your life through the campaign. But there is a limit ultimately on how many people you can sort of get, bring to a campaign, right? There, are, This is a limited resource. People's time is a limited resource. Additionally, good campaigns raise more money than they can expect. Whenever a candidate comes before me and says how much money they think they'll raise, I always in my mind double it because people are always underestimating how much money they can raise if they run good campaigns. But of course, like all things, that is a, that is also a limited resource, right? There's only so much money any one person can raise in any one campaign. And time, whew, we have yet to figure out how to go back in time. <laughs> I have never been on a campaign that didn't wish they had another week. I should say never. There's been once or twice. But, you know, I've done hundreds of campaigns at this point. Almost all of them wished they had another week. Almost all of them wished they had spent their time just a little bit better, had done a little bit more, right, with their time. So the thing about campaigns is that 
good campaigns use their time wisely, but it is a limited resource. There's only so much more time. If you're running for office in this November, you should feel like the election season is almost over. It is it is moving apace. It is going quickly. It is evaporating quickly. If you're running in 2022, you should have an urgency about the clock. 2022 November is around the corner. You should have some urgency because time goes away really quickly. There is a limited amount. It is a limited resource. And so we need to put a campaign plan together, understanding that our time, the amount of money we can raise and the amount of people we can raise, the amount of people's hours we can bring to the campaign is a limited resource source that we won't be able to just have it definitely we need to use it wisely so we need to put together a plan to do so that is why a campaign plan is so important and so i think it's really important because you all are here and most campaigns i come across don't have campaign plans this might be surprising to you but most campaign most campaigns i interact with don't have campaign plans they have vague ideas of what they want to do They'll say, oh, we want to do this, and we want to knock on some doors, and we want to send some mail, and we want to raise this amount of money. And I'm like, great, does it fit together? Is there a plan? Is there something together? And they'll say, oh, you know, I sort of like, no, that's not a plan. Having some ideas in your head is not a plan, right? A plan is something that you can look back on. It's something that you can refine. It is written down. It is typed someplace. It is a files. And, a, you know, a campaign plan could be a Google it could be a Google Doc, right? It could be, I mean, sorry, it could be a Google folder with all of these plans together, right? But it needs to be something physical, something that you can come back to. It's really important that you actually have a plan. Uh, <clears throat> you know, oop, skipped accidentally. One of the things that's most important when doing this work is knowing where you need to go and knowing where you've been and having something that you're revising so that you un so that you're grounded in your in the timelines plans all the things you need to do if you are just reacting and trying to just do the best you will always be off time you will never do all the things you need to do and you will be sort of like a one of those um, weather things right like you blow up and they just go like this and that is not a good campaign plan so you need to have a campaign plan. This is my pitch to say, have one. Make it something that you can uh, react to. And the great news is, Trained Democrats has you, right? This is what's so great about this resource that you are all here for. Trained Democrats, if you go to traindemocrats.org, they have templates for all of the pieces we're gonna walk through that you can plug and play, download to your computer, and then you'll have a campaign plan ready to go. So that's what's great about traindemocrats.org is those resources are there and available for you for free. So. You, um, you, what is uh, the first piece? The first question you need to answer on a campaign plan is your win number. It is the most important thing that you need to figure out. So NDTC defines it a little bit differently than I do in my day job. So NDTC um, defines a win number as the number of votes you need in order to win by a single vote in a two person race. This is 50% of projected turnout plus one vote. I like to not do that because I joke that you won't actually become the elected official, at least in Massachusetts. You'll just go to court and they'll make you redo the election, even if you win by technically one vote. Um, that happened here in Massachusetts when an election I was working on. So I never like to do it that way. I always do 51%. I think what's important to note is that you have a win number. So a win number is a, it is a guesstimate of how many people you think are going to vote and then how many votes you need to win out of that. There is a whole training on putting together a win number. That is not this training, right? That's not this training. There is a whole training on win numbers, okay? So don't worry. <laughs> um, if you want to learn more about that, we're not gonna dive into that today. We're gonna dive in, we're, there's a whole training on that. But this is a good definition. The other thing you need to know is your vote goal, right? Your vote goal. So the total number of votes you want to receive in an election, right? In a two person race, that's like 52 to 55%. Again, that's a really good guideline for you of a vote goal. So that's how many people you want to get to go vote for you. Like that's your goal of people to vote for you to ensure that you get your win number. 
So you always want more people to go vote for you than you actually need so that you have some wiggle room. Should people forget to go vote, they do other things, right? They're like, oh, I meant to vote. And then something came up, right? The, we all know those people. Um, it's bonkers to me to think about that, right? Like, oh, I'm, I'm sick. I don't feel like going today. You're just like, it's an election, you're democracy. What are you talking about? So you wanna have some, you wanna have some wiggle room on that piece. Are there any questions really quickly um, in the chat about win number or vocal or the beginnings of sort of this campaign plan? There were two in there, Jordan. Um, one is just uh, for local elections that have more than two candidates, is there a sort of quick way to figure out win number when it's no longer 51%? Um, there is not a quick way. It takes a little bit more guessing, and I would encourage you to go to the Train Democrats website on how to do that. Um, it, there is a system for doing it, which involves um, figuring out how many people are going to vote, figuring out how many people you think your least good opponent will do, and then figuring out what 51% of what's left of that. That's a little bit of a process, so I don't want to shortchange it for you. I'm sorry. I really want to encourage you to go to that training, and that way there's actually also a template on the website where you can plug and play that in. So I want to just encourage you to do that work and, and tell you that, unfortunately, um, that's a, just a, it's just a little bit more complicated and not easily answered in like a minute or two, and I apologize for that, but I think best to give you the best resources and not sort of shortchange you with an answer. Uh, and then we have one more here about um, hiring for the campaign plan. Um, if you plan on hiring campaign manager, is campaign plan something you should do ahead of time, let the campaign manager do it or do it together? Great question. I would hire a campaign manager and do it together. I don't like to do things myself. I like to have somebody check it. Having a professional check your work is the best way to do it. Are there things that you should be doing on your campaign plan without a campaign manager? 1000%. And we'll walk through some of the things that are really candidate focused that you should be focusing on yourself that will help you build a final campaign plan. But any sort of final campaign plan, I guess I'll say, or you know, more than that first draft should be done with someone else or a few people because you really want to make sure you're checking your work, checking your assumptions and having some other professional folks look at it. So I'd say yes-ish is the answer to that. Like there are some things that a candidate can do. There's some things that you'll answer. There's just some initial things that you'll want to do yourself in moving a campaign plan along. But in the end, um, it, it is something you want to do with, with people. Okay. <clears throat> so a campaign plan is a living document that details how a campaign allocates its time, money, and people to win between now and election day, whatever your election day is, and includes specific instructions for fundraising, communications, field, digital, GOTV, and operations. Um, and the lead staff has a campaign plan template for you, again, to just um, go right into, and you could do some of this work. It'll help you sort of move this along. So a campaign plan <coughs> has all of these pieces. And let me just say again that this is a, these are all individual real plans. These are not things that just live in your brain. They are all individual pieces of a campaign plan and you need to have them in some place. They need to be in a Google Doc, in a Word Doc, in whatever you're using, right? It needs to be a physical place. And they all need to fit together. This is so important. And again, something that surprisingly people get wrong all the time. It is shocking to me, but it's true. People get this wrong all the time. So your field plan, for example, has all of the, has your win number. It has all of the things you plan to do to get to it. All of the tactics that you plan to do, the timelines for your field plan that's in there. Your fundraising plan is how much money you wanna raise, how you plan to raise that money, but also the individual donors you hope to ask. That's the list making that you're gonna be doing for fundraising. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. That's in your fundraising plan. Your communications plan, right? Similarly, it's all the, um, your plan to talk to the press, your plan to send mail, your, uh, your messaging, right? We'll get into that. Digital plan is very obvious. Your social media, how you do digitally. Your get out the vote plan, GOTV plan, how you plan to do that last finaling stage and your operations plan, which is like your campaign staff, all those things. And that piece, you're probably gonna wanna put together some thought before you hire someone. So you have an idea of range, how much money you're spending initially, right? There are some pieces that you wanna go there. It's really important that they all fit together. Let me give you a really clear example of what I mean. 
about this. I do a ton of interviews with candidates and candidates will say to me, I'm going to run this grassroots campaign. I don't need to raise a bunch of money. Um, and I laugh at this because grassroots campaigns are actually really expensive. Doing nothing actually costs nothing. Um, and so um, they'll say to me, I plan to raise, uh, I don't know, $20,000. And then they'll say to me in their communications plan, they'll say, I plan to send eight pieces of mail. And I do some quick math, about 59 cents per piece in Massachusetts. It varies where you live. And I'll just be like, that's you're you're gonna spend like a hundred thousand dollars and you only want to raise twenty thousand dollars that that doesn't make sense right like just quick math says that that's impossible that happens all the time like all the time people underestimate how much they hope to raise and then they have all these plans to spend money and i'm just like if your fundraising plan if you pl the money you plan to raise is it more than the money you plan to spend you don't have a campaign plan you have a wish list right happens all the time. If your GOTV plan, you need to plan, is there gonna be a location for you to stage your get out the vote? Do you need to hire some extra people? Do you need a person who's just gonna coordinate your GOTV? What's your, what's your plan to feed people around GOTV? What's your plan to get on the doors? What's your plan for phone calls? Is there gonna be a place? Is it gonna cost money, right? So many times GOTV, no one puts money attached to the, how much it's gonna to cost to do that piece because they haven't planned it out. And so then that comes around and then they've run out of money and then they don't have money for a real GOTV. So again, these need to fit together. If you're telling your, if you're telling your supporters one thing and then you're telling the press another thing, that's a problem. Those need to fit together in the communications plan. Your fundraising and communications need to talk to each other. If you're sending emails to get people to come volunteer the same day you're sending people e emails to raise money, that might not work that well. It might, depending on how big your list is, but it might not if your list is smaller. You need to plan that out. You need to plan that out. So these are these aren't like these are things I see, right? These aren't like, oh, you know, it would be bad if this happens. These are common mistakes that I see on campaigns, and they're born from the fact that they don't have real plans. They don't have real plans. So don't be that person. Have a real plan. Have a real plan to make this work. So there's different phases of a campaign. There's different phases of a campaign. There's the persuasion side. This should feel obvious to you all. The persuasion side means simply you're trying to convince people to vote for you, right? Convince voters to vote for you, turning soft support into hard support, right? That's a, that's a part of persuasion. The persuasion part also includes the pieces, right? To getting people to come vote for you. So you also need to raise money to help contact voters to get them to vote for you. You also need to call volunteers to get volunteers to help you to raise money. I mean, to help you to contact voters to go vote for you, right? So there are pieces of the persuasion side that isn't simply talking to voters, right? But ultimately the persuasion sort of encompasses all of those pieces. This parts, the, 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 mach the uh, machinery of running for office is focused on convincing people to vote for you. And then there's a GOTV phase, which is a get out the vote pay phase, which is turning out supporters to vote. And you should phase that in. You should think about those phases in your election cycle. And what's important is that for some of you, depending on where you live, there might be overlap. There might be overlap. There, you might be persuading people and some people are going to vote. There might be some time where you're doing a little bit of both. You need to plan accordingly. You need to know that that's happening and you're going to have to plan that out. But basically for the simplicity of this beginning part, there are two phases to a campaign plan, your persuasion and your GTV. And that's a good, I like this because it's a good framework for thinking about your things. And this is true regardless of if it's a nonpartisan race or a primary race is, right? There is basically always going to be these phases of persuasion in GOTV. It might differ a little bit, but it's going to be roughly the same. I will tell you in Massachusetts, we have our municipal elections are nonpartisan elections technically, but we run them the same. There's still a persuasion time and a GOTV time, right? We still, we still do the same framing around, around the elections. The other way to think about your campaign plan, and this might be helpful for folks who are wondering sort of how do I think about this as I'm the only person currently working on this, right? It's just me, the campaign, uh, the, the person running for office. How do I think about this plan? 
And so it's really important to think about it as an iterative process over time that sort of builds out, right? So your information builds out and also your planning builds out in terms of time. So this visual shows the growth of your plan over time based on the information you will accumulate. So you're consistently building and iterating your plan. So yes, you need a real plan. And yes, it needs to be someplace that you can go back to because you are going to build upon it with more information, with more understanding, the more contact you do with voters, the more time that passes, the more that your opponent starts to do things that gives you an understanding of what they're doing. So you understand what you're doing, right? You build those in and you need to go back to your campaign plan to fix it over time and expand it so that it really is a full plan for you to win. The reality is your first initial part of your campaign plan might be a little rough, um, depending on how much information is available, um, which means that you'll, you know, these are often in the beginning, best educated guesses, right? And these are best educated goals. And your first quarter progress will give you an idea to fill in some of those things to better understand it. And we'll, we'll talk through uh, the individual pieces, how you might think about those things. As time progresses, the more that you learn about your campaign's metrics, the more you can fill in with details, All right? That, that seems pretty obvious. So the more as time passes, you can plan and more completely fill it in. And towards the end, you should have a good idea of what it will take for you to win by the time you get to your GOTV plan. Okay, <clears throat> discussion question. What are the initial pieces of information that you'll need to begin building your campaign plan and how are you going to get that information? So again, what are the initial pieces of information that you need to begin building your campaign plan and how are you going to get that information? So I can tell you from Massachusetts, one of the first places I always encourage uh, candidates to go is we have a thing called our um, <clears throat> we have a thing called our public document 43 or Massachusetts elections that tells you every election um, data since the 1970s and that's the first place I start any campaign plan I put together trying to figure out how many people will vote and how many votes I think my candidate will need to win so I begin any discussion I have with that piece um, well people are certainly responding for the, <laughs> uh, the information that they'll need. Um, who's your opposition? Info about the district. What are the demographics? Um, voters, vote builder, win number to field goals to budget, win number, vote goal, previous election data, vote goal. A lot of, a lot of the similar ideas uh, circulating here in the chat. Um, so are there questions about this first piece? Um, I know we did some questions. Are there further questions about this first piece? I do have some questions floating in here for you. Um, okay, great. Yeah, so so one is from um, Natasha. This kind of goes back to win number and vote goal. So Natasha is in a, uh, a new city that recently formed. So there's only, uh, the city was just formed in 2017. Um, and the winning vote count back then was 1307, right? But essentially this person does not have a lot of past data off of which to base um, this upcoming election. So what's the extent to which you can rely on that kind of past data? And I know she mentioned using some of our templates that give her different numbers, depending on what data she's using, if not substituting for that, the newer data. Oh man, um, we are going through this in Massachusetts. One of our um, towns recently went from an all at large to a ward and there's never been ward seats and they move the lines for what constitutes a ward. So there's new lines and some of you going through redistricting are gonna face this in 2022, 2024. So yeah, this is a common problem. Um, the answer is that there's no exact science around this. You are going to do your best guesstimate based on the information you have. So the first guidepost I, I will give you is actually to not think of it as like, what's the right number, but what's the most amount of work I need to do? So one of the things that you should be thinking about is how much work do I um, you want to do as much work as possible. You want to talk to as many voters as possible while tethered to reality because not everyone will vote. So actually, that's the first thing I would look for. And the thinking is like, what number is the biggest? Is there a reason it's larger? Is it because there's something wrong with the like precinct lines or because, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't quite fit. It's not a real one for one. Or 
is it that actually just this was an exciting race and that just a ton of people voted? If it was an exciting race and a ton of people voted and so that's the larger number, that's the number to go with in terms of how many people you think might vote. So it depends. And again, there's a whole training just on vote number, on, vote, on win number that I encourage you to do. But if you're looking just in the template, I would start to figure out like, why am I getting different numbers? And where does the different data, differential data come from? And what's the best guess at what is going to happen in the election that still gives me the most work to do? That's sort of the like guidepost for doing a win number, but it's less than ideal. I can tell you it's less than ideal. We did this recently again in a, in a town in Lowell in Massachusetts. And what we did there is we used the old data for the old wards. And then we merged two wards together because the lines are gonna be a little bit thing. And so we know that the whole ward isn't coming into the new ward, but because it's more people, we just figured, well, that's a good number. And then we can just sort of figure it out accordingly when we actually go talk to people it's less, there's, there's no right, there's no like, yes, this is the right thing to do. It's really difficult. And you're just going to have to do your best guesswork. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to not be able to say like, this is how you fix it. There's no quick fix. You're probably on the right track though. Um, other questions? Um, yeah, we did have a question earlier that came from Sean, I believe, about just the process of generally um, do we plan making for a primary versus a general and how you kind of reconcile the two of those differently? That's a fantastic question. It really depends on what your race is. So if your biggest race is the primary, then that's really where you wanna focus your energy on. If your biggest race is the general, then that's what you really need to focus on. If you need to get through a tough primary to get to a tough general, you need to plan for both. And I actually have a campaign plan that's like pre-election, like pre-primary campaign plan and post-primary campaign plan. And that's how I organize it. So I don't think of them as two elections. They need to, one needs to flow to the other, but you may be doing some things because you're going to be focused on, I got to get through this primary. So I need to focus my energy on that. And then I'll figure out how to, you know, get to the, uh, as I build out my information, based on the work I'm doing to get through the primary, I can then reassess my plan in the post-primary world to better, uh, to better get through that piece. So that's how I do it when I have those tough things as I really focus on the most important election. If they're both gonna be really tough elections, I focus on the first one in front of me and ensuring that I've done everything possible to get through it. And then I do a reassessment of my plan to make sure that it still is the best guidepost for getting through the general. When I do both, I do actually plan both. So I want to have one message. I want to make sure that the message works both for the primary and the general. I have fundraising goals that are fundraising goals for the primary and then fundraising goals for the general. I have vote goals for the primary and vote goals for the general, but my energy and my focus is on that first piece. And I'm not thinking about revising my general election plan that much until I get through that first piece. I hope that answers your question. Um, anything else? Um, one more. Okay, great. Um, how do you manage the level of detail in your plan to match um, kind of the level of race that you're that you're running at? Township, mayor, state, senate. I I like a lot of detail. I I think you know it's really not a question of detail. It's a question of time. How much time am I putting into it? Am I putting all of my energy into making sure I have the perfect plan and then not talking to voters and not raising money or talking to volunteers? That's wrong. You know, if I can put together a detailed plan that I then revise over time or my campaign manager is revising over time, uh, but I'm still focused on core parts of a campaign, that's okay. So I have had people come before me and they gave me a campaign plan and it had like research on, on gender, race, um, uh, uh, how income by their district. It had ideas on what the opponent might do, what they might do in that scenario. It had um, their message. It had their message box. It had all these things a part of it. It was detailed. Now they were two years away from their election. So they had the time and energy to do it. And as they got to the election, they weren't revising the plan all that much because they had put so much work and it was pretty good, but they were still revising it. But the majority of their time was still spent campaign planning. So I don't think of it as the problem of detail. It was not, it was a city council race. So it wasn't a huge race, right? But I think of it in terms of like, how much time is it taking for you to do it? And are there other things that you 
could or should be doing. So that's really how I think about the, guy, um, the guys for that. It needs to be detailed enough that somebody, if you were to leave it and never go back to it, that somebody else could execute it. And Jordan, real quickly, I know we have to start moving here again. Samuel just said that um, you were talking about document 43 at one point, and then I believe we may have switched um, paths, uh, but he just didn't want the thought to get lost. Um, and so wanted me, and if, if you could return to that or maybe save it till the end and make sure to return to it, just wanted to elevate that for him. Uh, sorry, in Massachusetts, there's a public document 43, which is where we get election data. It's also called election data, Massachusetts election data. So it's the same thing. It's just a place where you find out election, um, where it gives you 70 year, um, sorry, since the 1970 election, it has every election in Massachusetts for statewide office from 1970 to the present. So your state likely has something like that. I don't know every state's, um, I know NDTC has actually put together a resource for every state about where you can find that election data. So it is available through trained Democrats, but I, I don't know it off the top of my head for every state, like where you would get your election data, but every state has that publicly available. And that's your first place to figure out how many people are gonna go vote. Yep. All right, um, <clears throat> great. So just a quick refresher, all of your field, all of your pieces go together, your field plan, your fundraising, digital communications, yada, yada. Um, you wanna think of it again as a puzzle. Um, you wanna think of it as puzzle pieces that go together. So that's definitely how I think about it. And they all need to fit together to move forward. So what does that mean? Well, each part of your plan needs to have these five things. It needs to have first, obviously, your goals. Have a specific part of your plan that connects to reaching the campaign's vote goal. Your timeline, right? Your target, specific um, supporters for each tactic. Who are you trying to? Who are you trying to affect with the tactic you're using? The people who's going to execute that tactic and the budget funds allocated from the campaign to do that specific work. I want to highlight for a second your timeline, because this is so important, and this is not something that everybody understands. So I want you to really understand this piece. This is just so important, and I'm really excited that NDTC um, has included this as a part of the campaign plan. You want to work backwards from your election day to today. You don't start from today and plan forward. It's really hard to get a sense of like when things need to happen if you try to go from today forward. You actually wanna start from election day. You wanna start from election day and work backwards in your timeline. What does that mean? So let's say I'm trying to figure out when to send mail. When do I wanna send mail to my voters? What you do is you say, when do you want your last piece of mail to hit a, a voter's mailbox? Let's say it's the Thursday before the Tuesday, right? The Tuesday election, I want the last piece to hit that Thursday. Well, I need to work back, I'm gonna say two weeks. To, that's when it needs to be finished to ensure it gets to the, to the uh, mail company and the mail company then gets it to the post office and the post office has time to mail it to, the, to get in the inboxes. So I'm gonna plan two weeks ahead, two weeks behind that. So now I know when my last mail piece, when I need to have it finalized, maybe I'll give myself a week to write it, right? All right, when do I want my, my piece, my second to last mail piece? Boom, I want it the two days before my Thursday, right? So it's the Tuesday. Well, okay, I got them two weeks back, right? That's how you plan a campaign plan. You start from election day and you work your way backwards. I'll give you a step forward. I like to visualize election day. I like to close my eyes and visualize election day. What does it look like? How does it feel? Who's there? How many people do I need to be there to win my election? I like to visualize that. I like to visualize the day. And then I try to plan backwards from that. Okay, I need these many vote. I need these many volunteers to ensure that I've done it. I've raised this amount of money to ensure that I have a great GOTV plan. I've sent enough mail and I've talked to enough voters. I have this number of, of people who've said they're gonna vote for me, my win number and my vote goal, right? I've made that to ensure that I'm gonna win that election. I like to work from that visualization and work my way backwards. That's the way you plan a timeline for the thing. 
If you're planning communications, right? When do I want a reporter to write about my race? I start with when do I need a report? When's the last thing time I want to be in the newspaper? Are there rules about when a letter to the editor can appear? When's the closest to election a letter to the editor will appear? Is my is my newspaper going to make an endorsement? When will that hit? Do I have a plan to beat for that? Right? You want to work from that backwards rather than just sort of doing things in the or just like I don't know. I need to make that happen in two weeks from now. Like that's not how you plan. Plan from election day backwards. And if you're doing the planning right, you can plan all the way to today, to the present. <clears throat> and again, um, Train Democrats has all of these templates available with a table of contents and a complete train um, plan for all of it. So again, um, they will share with you the um, they will share with you this Google Doc uh, that has all of these pieces. Okay, so. First up is the field plan. And it's the field plan is where we'll do all the math with your vote goal. So what does it, what do you need a win number for? Well, a win number tells you everything on a campaign. It tells you everything on a campaign. How much money do I need to raise? How many votes do you need to win? How many people do you think will vote? right? That will tell me how much money you need to raise. How many volunteers do you need to recruit? Depends on how, on what your win number is. How many people do you think are going to go vote, right? How much mail do I need to send? How many hours do you need to work on a campaign, etc.? All of them are defined by your win number. How many people you think are going to go vote and how many of them you need to convince to go vote for you defines everything on a campaign. That is why it's called a universe in campaign parlance because it's everything, it defines everything. How much time you need, how many volunteers, how much money you need to raise, it's all defined by your win number. So if you don't have a win number, you don't have a campaign plan. You're just sort of doing things, <laughs> right? You need to know how many people you think are gonna vote and then how many of them you need to go vote for you. You need to know. It's the critical piece to any plan and everything else comes out of that piece. Everything else comes out of that piece. Um, your vote goal, your voter universe, your voter contact tactics, when you're gonna door knock, where you're gonna door knock, how much door knock you're doing to phone calls, who you're gonna door knock, how much volunteer capacity you need to get all these things done. All of that is in your field plan, right? It also includes your ballot access plan. How are you gonna get on the ballot? You know, each state is different. Make sure that's in your field plan, right? All the pieces to a field plan are in your field, are in this piece, vocal, voter universe, how you're gonna get to that, how you're gonna talk to these people, right? And how many hours, volunteer hours you need to get there. Here's a really good sample field plan with, again, um, all of uh, uh, plug and play for things you need to get there. <clears throat> and you'll see a timeline for how, how to get there on, a, on election day. I'm just gonna give you a little anecdote for this that I, that I love. So my former boss at my organization worked on a state Senate campaign and she was out drinking one night with the consultant on the campaign. And um, you know she had never really run a large GOTV and she asked the campaign consultant like, how many volunteers do you think I'll need? And he was like, I don't know, like 300. And she went back to her car and she cried, which if you know her, is something she like literally never does. And then she put up a big butcher paper and she marked off a bunch of hours, volunteer hours with 300 people. And she went about filling it. <coughs> um, the consultant never said like, no one had ever gotten to that 300 goal when he was doing it, but she did get to it and she filled it out, but she had planned accordingly, right? She had planned out throughout the campaign. And because they worked from that, what do we need to win on election day and work backwards? They were able to get there. They were able to get there. So that's the importance of, of planning. And this is a good template that will get you to where you need to go. Are there any questions really quickly about the field program? Uh, before we move on to the fundraising piece. Field should be, I hope, the easiest for people to grasp. It's sort of the most forward-facing and easy for people to understand. Just um, one question as it relates to field for outreach. Um, how do you change, in this case, it was about phone bank managers, their thoughts and trying to 
uh, for this person, they didn't want to do too many phone calls because they wanted to do GOTV outreach. So how do you kind of do that lateral management and downward management of folks to help them focus their field tactics toward the right place for the right goal? Um, well, hopefully you have some buy-in from the people in charge to be able to get them to be doing the things you plan to be successful. I will tell you the way I do it on any campaign is I tell people how we plan to win. So I give them the plan. I tell them, here is why we're doing these tactics. Here are the people we hope to affect by these tactics. And that's why we need to maybe change the way we normally do things. Um, so that's how I attack it is I just let people in on the campaign plan. I put up on any campaign I've ever worked on. In fact, when my wife ran for school committee behind me on one side was the vote goal um, and the other side was the win number. And we had that up there and we put, so whenever somebody came in, we informed the tactic that they were doing based on, um, on those numbers and we just referenced it all the time so that by the time we got to GOTV, no one was questioning what we the plan we had in place because we had trained them over eight months explaining that everything we were doing was focusing on getting to that win number. So that's how I do it. I let people in on the plan. Um, I don't, you know, I think everybody ultimately is a little bit different about how you move people. Um, hopefully the person in charge is moving people, right, to do the right things with their time and managing folks. That's usually the best because, you know, campaigns are top down. So hopefully somebody is just in charge of making those strategic decisions. Um, I, I guess I'd need to know a little bit more about why that isn't happening, right? Like why, why um, you might need to do it. But I think if you need to make um, changes to that, you should just do it. You should just do it if it makes sense for your campaign plan. Cool. Uh, and one more question. Can you just elaborate on the differences between the outreach and persuasion um, segments? Yeah. Uh, so in this case, the outreach is often, uh, <clears throat> you know, the pieces you need to begin a conversation. They're not, they're the persuasion uh, piece to a campaign is the outreach is a part of that, but oftentimes when you first start in a campaign, right? If you're if you're there for November election in March, right? People are gonna be like, "What are you doing here? <laughs> Why are you here? What's happening?" Right? Like a November. Wait, the, it's a November and you're here in March. Why Why are you here? Right? So that's traditionally considered outreach because it's hard to persuade people that early away from an election. So you're really just doing some initial conversations with voters for a November election. As you get to the hot summer and people start to tune in that an election is coming, you're gonna have more persuasion happening on a campaign, which means you're gonna do actual work to say like, can I count on your vote? And people are gonna be saying yes, rather than wait, what's happening? Why are you here? <laughs> so that's sort of a distinction. Technically, the outreach is a part, again, there, the two ways to think about it is it's still a part of the persuasion, part of the campaign plan. It's not the GOTV part, but it is often thought of as a little bit different. Yeah, just because it's so early. Great. Um, let's move along. So the next piece is my favorite piece, the fundraising plan. So the part of the campaign plan that outlines the uh, fundraising goals, strategies, and tactics to raise the money needed by election day. So this isn't a fundraising training, although I do fundraising trainings because I love fundraising. What I will tell you is that um, for those of you who are like, ah, about this piece, fundraising is about attitude. I like to say all the time that you're not giving to an individual person. If you if you think of fundraising as, oh my God, people need to donate to me, to me, uh, you're not gonna raise enough money because it's gonna feel awkward. You're not really gonna be that invested in it. And it's hard for donors to understand the important, they might like you, they might be related to you, but they're not gonna give as much unless they're inspired to do so. So rather than thinking of fundraising as they need to give to me or to my campaign, what you really need to think about is what change do you hope to make in the world? What do you, what's your reason for running for office? What change are you gonna make in your community? How will your community look if all the things that you want to do happen? How will it be transformed? Now hold that piece in your brain. Again, I like to visualize it. Hold that piece in your brain. Invite donors into that vision. People want their communities to be better. They want change. And you're gonna invite people to donate to that, to the vision of what the change you hope to make the vision of the community you want to make in the future. 
when I'm doing my fundraising for my organization, I'm not like asking like, hey, can you pay the salaries of my staff members? Although that is largely what the fundraising goes for. I think about all the people I'm able to help, all of the campaigns we've been able to have a mark on, all of the issues we've been able to steward to make Massachusetts a better place. I hold those in, in the hands, in my in my brain, in the and I give those to the donors and I invite them to be a part of that change. And that is how you're successful at fundraising. So that is my little piece, my little suggestion, my advice to you when thinking about fundraising is to not like to let go of some of your tension and bristle around it and embrace that you're asking people to be a part of this change in your community and you're asking them to give part of it and who wouldn't want to donate to make their community a better place, right? Everyone wants to donate to that. So a fundraising, a fundraising plan has your call time. Call time is the way in which most of your donations will come in. You also need a revenue stream for events, for digital, for unions and PACs, and how your finance committee will fit into this. Additionally, your fundraising plan needs to have timelines, how much you need to raise by when, right? So it needs to have a sense of your, your fundraising um, plan needs to have some timelines. It needs to have a plan on how events fit into that timeline. So don't just have events and then have an event here and there. Like don't be haphazard about it, have it planned out so it makes sense. So it, you know, so you, you're building towards something and you want your digital again to have a timeline and plan and fit into it. Will it have pieces you need to buy ads for? Will it have things you're spending money to raise money? You need to plan all of those out, right? Again, you want goals, you want tactics. All of those are a part of any plan that you put together and fundraising is no different. This is a great, um, this is a great example of what a call time sheet might look like. It might be quarter one goal, how many hours you hope to spend on getting there, right? And you wanna have a date of how much money you want to raise, how much, um, how many new pledges you wanna have by that time, how much hours you spent doing call time. This is a really great example of a fundraising call time plan. Call time plan is the most important way to raise money. If you're doing an event, and the way to ensure an event is successful is to do call time, right? Whenever my organization has a fundraising event, I like to have been successful and raised the money for the event before I even open the doors to the event or before I turn on the Zoom for the event. I want to have raised my fundraising goal for that event. So that means that I have to call people, tell them it's happening, encourage them to give to it, welcome them into that space. Um, that is a really important piece. I, it doesn't need to look like this. I'm partial to Google Sheets or Excel Docs as a way to also track this. Um, this is a really good template. There are lots of ways to do this. What's important is that you actually track this information in your fundraising. Are there any quick questions about fundraising before we get into communications? No questions from the chat. All right, great. Let's move it along. I want to encourage you to dig into fundraising. Don't be scared of it. It's a, it's just a great way to ask people to be involved in your campaigns. Not everybody has time to door knock or phone call or text bank or other things, but even, but everybody can give a little. And if everybody in our, in our world gives a little, we can transform our communities. So I just want to encourage you to dig into fundraising and not be intimidated by it. Okay. The part of the, camp the communications plan is the part of the campaign plan that details a campaign's overall message and how that message will be amplified to our communities. This is a fantastic definition because too often we think of a campaign, a communications plan is like, when are we gonna talk to reporters? That's not a campaign plan. I mean, a communications plan. A communications plan is how we are, what is our message? What do we want voters to know about us? How will they decide how to pick us over our opponent or opponents? What's at stake at the election? Your message is the purpose of a communications plan. So you need to know the message and you need to figure out how you're gonna amplify it. And that will happen in lots of different ways. Yeah. So your message is an important piece of your communications plan. And I wanna encourage you to go through the process of doing message planning and message training um, I happen to be friends with the person who did, uh, I think the most recent message uh, plan through NDTC. I cannot encourage enough for you to do that training with trained Democrats. It's a really critical piece to your campaign, right? If you've ever heard the old adage, if you're off message, if you're not on message, you're off message. 
you need to be on message all the time and your communications plan is where that lives. <clears throat> so uh, communications plan will include your boilerplate um, and by your biography, your campaign message guidelines, like how do you talk about issues, right? So a lot of the times people will say, well, my message are these three issues. Issues are not a campaign message. Um, let's say my issue is education. What we really need is somebody who has a lot of experience on education to pass this forward. Well, what we really need is somebody with new, with a new approach, somebody who hasn't, you know, who isn't in the weeds of campaign of, of education to really have a new to get things done. Or what we really need is somebody who brings people together to find the solution to fix our education problems. What we really need is an outsider, somebody who's not a part of the system that's failed us in education, right? There's endless ways you could talk about an issue. Your messaging guide, your campaign message guide tells you how to talk about these issues on message. It's a really important piece. Additionally, you wanna have a media list. So you should get to know the reporters. And this is a piece you definitely, unless you're a total political nerd, you probably don't know the reporter's names who cover the politics in your area or across your state. You're gonna to need to create that list over time or hire somebody to help you who has it, who can help you do it. Your communications calendar, you want to have a timeline, again, for how you communicate both through the press and your paid media, your digital advertising, your pay, your physical mail, right, your radio ads, your TV ads, if you can afford them, that all fits into their communications calendar, um, excuse me, your rapid response, Ooh, I'm a little bit everywhere with this thing, your rapid response, how you, re how you reply quickly to folks, you want to have stories available to tell your story and obviously their style guide, which is like what your campaign logo looks like. What are your colors? What are the ways you communicate so that everything again feels on message? Your pictures, your, your colors, your fonts, those are all a part of the message and they all need to be the same and you need to have them all planned out. Um, this is a great communications media list. I love this media list. It's really clear. Again, it's an easy Excel doc that just says a little bit about who they are, where they're in. And your campaign plan will have like, we're going to talk to this person about this. They like this type of story, right? That's often in the notes. I can tell you having done enough political work that reporters like to write a certain type of story and you get a rhythm for that over time. So you will know this reporter likes to write this thing around this time and that's when I'll talk to them about that story. So again, your communications plan has all of those pieces. That level of detail will not be how you start. You as a candidate likely don't have those answers. You are going to build that out over time. That's the, another piece that you're going to build out over time. As you get to know more and more, if you have a template that people that you can plug this information into, it will make you more successful and actually putting this together. Are there any quick questions about that? About the communications plan, fundraising, or any other pieces that we've talked so far? Um, so there is one from uh, Bill, and I think this may serve as a good segue into the next section, but um, can you speak more to the interactions between the communications plan and the digital side of things as those kind of need to, there's some necessary overlap between the two? Yeah, yeah. And I will say, honestly, I, I often put my digital plan in my communications plan. I don't think they need to be separate. They can be separate. NDTC makes them separate. Um, there's, there's not a right answer. It's a preference to this thing. Um, I like to have my digital uh, plan. I want to know when I'm planning to send physical mail. And I like to ensure that any digital ad buys I do match up with the communications plan. If I have a good story planned in a report in a newspaper, I want to amplify, I want to encourage people to read it through my digital plan. So they should be really close in contact. I think if you are running a plan, if you're running a digital program that's entirely separate from the way you're communicating through your media, I mean, through the media, through your mail program, your physical, your door knocking pieces, your palm cards, right? All of the physical mail you're doing, I think voters get confused. So I really like to have them look the same, feel the same and be talking about the same things over time. So I try as best I can through my digital planning to plan that out, right? 
you will be responding to things on a campaign and your digital plan will have to marry that rapid response, which means that you might have to change what you're doing that week or cha or, or put your, um, you know, you had this post and you're going to have to save it for another time, right? That's going to happen. But as much as you can plan that out, the better. Another thing I've been doing more and more, and again, this is a way that they're all fitting together, is sometimes I, I don't, if I'm, if I have a large area that I'm trying to work in, like a state senate race, for example, I will run some digital ads in the town that I'm going to be door knocking and phone calling. So that's the way my digital plan fits into my field plan. So that I'm amplifying the work I'm doing on the ground with a digital plan to communicate with people on the ground. That's another example that they should all sort of, the, the puzzle piece piece that they should all fit together. That's another higher level thing that I've been doing more. And I plan that out with my campaign plan. So in my campaign plan, I'll have a timeline for when I plan to hit certain communities. That's a part of my field plan. I'm gonna hit this part of the community this time. I'm gonna hit this part of the community this time, this part of the community this time. And then my digital plan is similar to my field plan. I'm gonna buy some ads for this community in this time. I'm gonna buy some ads for this, right? Similar, same thing. So that's just another way that they can all fit together and they should all be talking to each other. And in some places they're, they're overlapping plans. The important thing is that you write it down and have it out. Other questions? No, not for this section. Great. All right. Nice segue, thank you, to our digital plan. <laughs> this is the part of the campaign plan that outlines how to use digital tools to engage with voters online. Yeah, this is, this is an important piece. Increasingly really critical to the work that you're doing on a campaign. We need to utilize our digital because that's where a lot of people are. And not just Facebook and Instagram. I mean, and not just Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok. I mean, like Hulu ads. I mean, like in game, in um, if you ever play mobile games, in mobile games, are there banner ads on a website, right? These are all your Google Word ads. What happens when you search for a thing? Does it come up? I like to buy Google Word ad for, let's say I'm running for state rep. Um, of a community, right? I'll, I'll buy a Google Word ad. So when you search state rep in this community, my campaign is the first thing that pops up, even in the ad, right? Just a simple thing. So these are all a part of your digital plan. Are you emailing? If so, when? Um, NDTC puts texting into your digital plan. That's fine. This is a fine place for it, right? So you're going to think about your texting program here, maybe. All of those pieces connects together with the other campaign in what we call a digital plan. So it's your email, your social media, your texting, your digital advertising. Um, they're all go towards your goals, um, to the goal setting and strategic thinking. They need to be a part, they shouldn't be an afterthought, which too often campaigns they are. You need to make sure that they are working together with your other pieces, which means you want to plan it out as best as possible. Again, when you're starting out, this might not be that filled out. You might not have exactly what you want to do. You're not exactly clear on how to buy an ad in a mobile game when you first start out, right? You're gonna need some support. You might need to hire a campaign manager who calls someone to figure it out. This is a piece that will be built out over time. You don't need the answer right away, but you do need to have some templates in place and some planning in place. And you do wanna have, you know, when you're starting off, right? Most camp, um, when you're starting off and you start talking to voters, most voters will search for you on Facebook on, and on the internet. They'll Google you, right? When you come to their door to find out a little bit more. So if you're running for office, you need to have that ready to go before you start talking to voters. So there are some pieces that you need to start off with. But a lot of the individual pieces of the digital side of it, you can build over time as you start to get a better sense of your campaign plan. Um, so again, actually plan this out, put together some templates, put this together in your campaign plan, and know that this will expand as you get a better sense of what you're doing and bring on more people to help you support you with this process, especially if, if, you're, not, if you're not as native, if you don't do these things on a regular basis. Um, 
this is a really good, again, metric for your, um, this would be a robust congressional email campaign plan, maybe a large state Senate, depending on how large your state Senate is in your state, right? This is a lot of people, but let's just say this is, um, this is something you might do, email subscribers, you want your active subscribers, that means how many people have opened an email in the last six months, you want some growth, so you want to be adding people to this list, um, your open rate, you want to know how many people are opening it, and your click through, etc., and how many people are taking actions. So this is a really good template to get a sense of if your emails are working. Again, you don't want to just do things to do things, you want to know if they're working. So if you're sending email, and it never results in anybody donating or volunteering, then you're sending bad emails. Why are you know, you need to have a why spend that time if it's not being effective. You want to know that it's effective, you want to do some simple ma uh, matrix. And you want to be improving, planning, seeing what works and what doesn't work. If you don't know how to do this, again, get MailChimp, get a different thing, get something easy for your campaign, so that um, so that your campaign pay, so that your campaign manager or somebody else who can work this out for you can easily find the metrics to ensure that you're doing the work correctly. Um, this is just one piece of a digital mail of a digital mail plan. You might you'll have this also for your digital ads. You want to make sure that your digital ads are working. You want to know how many people are clicking on it, how many people are going to your website, taking an action from your digital from your digital ad buys. You want to have some metrics on these things so that you know that they're working. You don't want to just do things to do things. You don't want to just spend money to spend money. You want to have some idea that all of these things are working so you can refine your work as time goes on to be a little bit better. Are there questions about the digital plan before we get into GOTV? Chat box is clear for now, but also right. um, So GOTV or get out the vote, <laughs> the part of your campaign plan that outlines your get out the vote phase, which is the final phase of focusing on mobilizing Democrats and identifying supporters to vote. So uh, it's important to note that your GOT, GOTV is often the least understood part, the least planned part and understood part of any campaign plan, uh, because it's just sort of like this thing that happens, like, oh, we're just going to go get people to go vote. And like, you can basically do that. Uh, but I would encourage you to have a real plan in place. I will tell you also that this is a great job for a volunteer. I often have a volunteer who from the beginning of the campaign is planning the get out the vote campaign. So yes, they are still contacting voters. Yes, they're still door knocking. Yes, they're still phone calling, but they are also assigned from the campaign manager to be planning our GOTV day. And why does it take months to plan? There's so many things that you need to think about. It's a going out of business sale. Everything must go. Everything that you've been working on needs to happen. And if you are like many states increasingly have some form of early voting, that get out the vote can be weeks, if not months. And you don't want to just be leaving it to the afterthought of like, I, I, when I get to it, we'll figure it out. You want somebody who's thinking about it all the time, if you can, if you can. But you certainly want to have a plan in place from the jump, from the get-go. So your GOTV plan has your GOTV universe and script. That means the people who you think we're gonna, who you think are gonna go vote for you, people who've agreed to vote for you, and some maybe some other people who you think are likely to vote for you. It's gonna have your vote goal so that you know what your plan is for that. Your contact plans, how are you gonna talk to people to encourage them to either go vote or fill out a form or fix their form or whatever it is in your state that, that you need to go through to actually cast a ballot. And then you're also digital and mail programs. How are you encouraging your voters to go vote? How are you being, how are you encouraged? How are you, do you have a door knocker that you put on the doors to say, go vote today, which is an effective means to go vote today. Additionally, this needs to fit in again with your other pieces. Texting people who agree to vote for you is an effective way to get them to go vote as well as leaving literature on their door as well as phone calling them. So you need to have that in place from the get-go. You need to have money set aside to know how much you're gonna spend on these things. I'll give you some other things that I think about that often don't get thought about when thinking about campaign plans, um, GOTV plans. Are you gonna be someplace? This was a question not so much last year during COVID, but especially as we emerge from COVID, um, slowly maybe than others, but you know, as we get there eventually, um, are you going to be convening someplace? Is there enough parking? 
where you plan to have all these people? Are you able to make phone calls in this place? Are there enough rooms so it's not loud when you're trying to make phone calls? Is there a place that people can go make phone calls quietly? There's pieces to a G to get out the vote that you need to plan accordingly and you need to plan ahead of time. And you wanna plan from backwards, right? So if let's say you have a November election but people can start voting in October, you need to plan from October backwards how are you gonna prepare for that October date? And let's say you're also convincing people to vote at the same time that you're also convincing people who've agreed to vote to go vote for you, right? To actually go out and vote. You need to have a plan in place that you're gonna be doing two things at once. That's really difficult for a campaign and you wanna plan accordingly to ensure that that's happening. Um, <clears throat> so this is again, the same document you might have saw earlier with the recruitment goals and hours beforehand and a GOTV. Um, this is the this is another piece to understand that they all fit together. Um, they all go together. What does a good GOTV plan look like? Like, what does it actually look like? My GOTV plans have what I want to tell people when I leave messages. Do I leave them every time I call somebody or just the first time? I tend to be just the first time, but everybody might be different. Are there early voting rules that I need to know? Are there early voting location that I want to communicate? If I do want to communicate them, what's my plan? Am I going to send people mail? Am I going to do a digital ad buy to my, um, am I going to try and target some people who I think are going to vote for me to encourage them to know when they can vote early, right? That's also in my GOTV plan. Am I going to have a physical location? What's my budget? I need to have food. I need to have water. I need to have uh, paper towels because it's gonna you know, like people are gonna be coming in and out. I need to have all of those things in place, and I want to plan accordingly. Am I gonna hire people for my last final days for GOTV to have some extra to make ensure I have some extra people to make sure it goes well? I need to make some sure I have some money for that. I need to have a plan in place for hiring those people. When am I gonna hire them? Right, there's so those are some pieces to a GOTV plan that I often have in my GOTV plan. There's a lot more there that you can expand as you get going, but my impulse, my my thing to tell you is you need to start planning for get out the vote today. No matter where you are, no matter when your election is, you start today, and you need to be thinking about it all the time, because it is the it's the it's the get out the it's the um, going out of business. You need to be thinking about how you're doing that final piece. Okay. The last piece of a campaign plan is your operations plan. And this is where your budgets go in. This is your organizational structure, your policies, how you're gonna hire people, any legal compliance, human resource compliances that you need. These are all gonna go together into your operations plan. This is also a piece, I will tell you some plan, some campaigns have been caught off guard by this. You Are you gonna, is your staff gonna be unionized? You should plan that in the beginning. Don't be caught off guard, and then you have a, and then your campaign, like your campaign, goes down in the gutter because you didn't think about like, is my campaign staff going to be unionized? Plan that accordingly. Plan ahead of time. Know that that might be a piece that happens, especially if you're running a large statewide campaign. Your staff might want to have some collective bargaining rights. If I know that's the case, I might want to plan now. <laughs> for that to happen. Maybe line up a union to work with to say, yes, my, any staff we hire is gonna be union and here's, and like, we're gonna bargain with these people, right? You can plan ahead of time for these things so you're not caught off guard. This is obviously big right now, the New York mayor's race that this blew up. Uh, this happened in the presidential, it's happened in some senatorials. You can plan accordingly. So your staffing plan, your overall budget for your campaign, your budgets for each individual piece, the materials you hope to buy. So a time, so not like what they say and when they'll go out, but like how much are you gonna spend? 5,000 pieces, like that's all in your operations. The overview of your district, any legal compliance, there's lots in your states, I'm sure. You wanna have all of those, those all go into operations or ops, as they say in the campaign world. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, those all wanna go together in your operations plan. <clears throat> this is a really important piece because people often leave it to the end, but you need to have a plan in place ahead of time. And if you can, especially, this is also where you're like, how are you paying people? Are they independent contractors? Are they staff? Are you having a payroll service? This is all the places that you want to have those pieces. Are you offering health insurance? I would encourage it. If not, you need a plan in place for why they don't have insurance or what you're going to do with that. All of those go into your operations plan. And again, don't get caught off guard. 
don't have like a, I'm going to raise this money, but I don't know how I'm going to spend it or have an operations plan and don't know how you're going to raise it, right? These all need to go together and that's why you're going to put them all in place. Okay. <clears throat> Here's an example of a reporting deadline. So this is when you report how much money you've raised in New Mexico as an example. So you need to plan that out because you want people, you can use reporting deadlines as a way to raise money. Additionally, you're gonna have to talk to the press, probably put out a statement, maybe release your numbers depending on your state and how it works around these reporting deadlines. So it's important to know these dates. And so that's why it's gonna go in your operations plan because it, there's so many pieces that it will affect. It'll affect your fundraising, both you can use it to fundraise and also you need to report it. It affects your communications plan, right? It affects your digital. Are you gonna ramp up digital ad buys to try to get some digital fundraising in, right? They're all gonna go around this time. So you need to know these dates, right? So this is a good example of a really simple reporting deadline, but know how these all interact with one another and, 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 um, and sort of build out. If after the operations plan, you're like, this feels really overwhelming, it probably will, right? So that's why you probably wanna bring on some extra staff to help you work through some of these pieces because this is a lot for one person to hold. It's too much for one person to hold alone, for sure. Are there questions about this piece before we get into how to use this and adapt it? There are uh, some that I'm gonna hold until the end just because we're a little okay. under 15 minutes here. So I wanna make sure yep. we get everything and then we'll yep. recap yeah, yeah. everything at the end. Okay, all right, we'll move it along. All right, <clears throat> how to use it a plan and adapt your plan accordingly. So you've got now an understanding of all these elements. How do we actually put them together to balance and be flexible to adapt all these things together? So your plan, you have the, you set your goals, you choose some metrics, you define your metrics, and you need to track how it's going, right, to execute and collect data, and then you're going to revise and debrief your plan accordingly. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you want to start off with, like, what's the most urgent and important, how effective have you been at that thing, and then make some changes accordingly. You don't want to just do to do or continue doing. You need to plan all of these pieces, and good campaigns do these pieces all together. So, like, what does this mean in reality? Like, how do I actually put this into practice? Um, I'll just give you an easy example. Good campaigns have information come in, they evaluate that information, and then they, they make plans to evaluate based on data and not anecdote, like not somebody said something and I'm going to change everything, but okay, let's do some informed um, figuring out, and then they go to adapt differently. So let's say you're on the campaign plan. I'll give you a real example that happened. Um, somebody was attacking one of our candidates based on their home ownership and like the fact that they owned a home which is, you know, a thing. And so our campaign, our, our candidate was nervous, you know, um, three volunteers heard about it on the doors that they were like, oh, you know, does she even understand the concerns as a renting community? And she owns that, like, she must be rich, she owns a house. And so, um, and so we were like, okay, well, we got to figure out, is this something that regular voters are in mass worry about and we need to formulate an answer. So our communications team formulated an answer and our field program added a question to the field and phone calls saying like, hey, um, you know, we went through the thing, we introduced the candidate. We also said, um, she is a homeowner. Have you, do you know about this? Does that affect your thinking about, a, about voting for her or not? When we actually talked to voters, it turned out that they didn't actually cared that much about this piece. It was just a few people who had heard this talking point and they were angry about it, but most people didn't matter. But we didn't want to just dismiss it. We wanted to evaluate it. So we added a question to our door knocking script and phone banking script, just to suss out, is this something that people care about? And then if we needed to, we had some language that we were gonna to add to our communications if it was something they were worried about to just have that conversation. She had bought it with her mom who was moving in with her. This was like a the way that they were building things and it speaks to like how hard it is to buy a house, right? We had some messaging. So that's a way to take in information, adapt what you're doing, but, but have a plan to adapt it and then make changes if need be. That's a really, so you wanna do this for all the pieces, again, if, you're, if your email's not working, you need to evaluate. If you're, if you're not getting people to like your page or go through your page or donate from your, fund, from your digital buys, you need to change up what you're saying or how you're doing it, right? So evaluate accordingly. All right, 
So you want to do some progress um, monitoring. So you want to progress to goal spreadsheet, which again is something you can find at Trade Democrats that really helps you lay out how far are we doing, how are we doing, and you want to know all the time. This is easiest with voter contact and fundraising because you have clear goals and you can set timelines for how you want to get there, but you need it for all pieces of your campaign so you can evaluate what you're doing. You have precious limited resources, precious time, precious money, not enough time, uh, not enough people have enough time, and you need to be evaluating everything you're doing. And so you want to have blocks of time to ensure that you're tracking it and then also make sure that you're tracking all these pieces. Uh, <clears throat> all right. We are going to skip this uh, discussion question, what kind of developments might cause campaigns to make decisions to alter plans. Uh, and we're going to skip right to this piece. When you need to make decisions to adapt. So in fundraising, here's some good piece, places where you may need to make a decision to change what you're doing. Fundraising pledge that was a confirmed commitment that did not materialize. You may need to change how you're going about things if that's happening a lot. Communications, local or national issues shifting during election, you need to shift how you're talking about things or how you're talking about those issues. Things come up, right? That's a, that's a place that you often need to adapt. Field difficulty identifying enough supporters to hit your vocal, that's the most common problem. You need to change, am I talking to everyone? Do I need to expand the people I'm talking to to get some unlikely voters who might be able to come vote for us, right? That's what happened in Georgia. They expanded the number of people who might vote and had voter increases that enabled us to have those victories. So you, you know that's a common field thing that you might need to adapt. Digital, similarly, your MLS is not generating enough. And GOTV, I have too few supporters. What do I do? How do I plan? You need to make a plan in place to actually um, have those. So those are places as you're campaigning, right? Not in the beginning where you are now. As you're planning, you're going to need to adapt your plan accordingly. Okay. So some of the takeaways we want you to take away from this training are all parts of your campaign plan work together. I think I've said that many times. Working with your campaign plan is an iterative process, which means it changes over time. And checking in with your team on progress towards goals on a regular basis, that can be daily or weekly, is crucial to success. More than anywhere else, it's really crucial to success. Anywhere else that I've worked, it really is a critical part. All right. Are there any final questions in the last seven minutes we have for uh, for these pieces? Yeah, um, cool. Let's start with um, Tammy. Tammy, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, um, but they asked, do you think it's best to put all of your thoughts and beliefs about every issue on your website right from the beginning or wait to kind of reveal the key ones over first and then over time reveal more? What are your thoughts there? I think it's, I, I'm more, I'm partial to having you lay out the critical pieces to your campaign and then doing a judge of what's actually important to voters as I talk to them. Um, I think eventually when you get close to election day, you can have all the pieces you feel like are important for voters to know, but I am more on the side of just like start with some key things, listen to people, learn about what's happening in the community, um, community and adapt accordingly always with your values. You should never say something you don't believe is untrue or doesn't feel right to you, but you should be, be it's a representational democracy. You should be listening to people and adapting accordingly. So I like to just sort of lay it out as time goes on. Cool. And sort of sticking in the digital theme here, I'm thinking about the overlap with digital and fundraising. Um, how much do typical ads cost? How do you think about those costs and factor them in? Are there any platforms that you would recommend that are particularly useful or efficient? Um, so that it varies wildly depending on how many people you have, what you're buying, how what what type of thing. I, there's no right answer to that question. It just it varies wildly on the type of advertising, where you're advertising, what you're advertising, right, wh where you are in the in the in the U.S. So there's no answer to that question. There are some things that I uh, would recommend as as things. I will say I don't work for NDTC that way. So I don't know if there's things that NDTC approves or doesn't approve. So I would say if you have questions about that, you can contact me afterwards. My contact info will be coming up and I can give you some of my personal suggestions on who I have worked with over the years, um, but I, I don't want to step out of line for NDTC. <laughs> so I'll say that, um, yeah. Um, cool, we just have two more that we may be able to knock out quickly. Um, okay. One is just, 
is there a formula for a number of volunteers needed for number of votes going into the field realm here? Or just how do you conceptualize the number of volunteers you need when thinking about your vocal win number? It's planning like that. So there's no, there's, um, there is a template on the website that does a best guesstimate, but it does vary. So I'll just give you an easy example in within the state of Massachusetts. If you're in Boston, in Massachusetts, your vote, your vote contact to volunteer hours is smaller because the close people are close together. You can knock a house and there's three people living in it. And so you don't need that much. If you're out in Western Massachusetts, which is very rural and some of the places have five miles in between houses, one of my campaigns was biking. <laughs> door knock biking, they would hit 20 doors in two hours. That's a different volunteer hour. So it does depend on your community. You'll refine what NDTC has. So NDTC does have a template, but you will refine that based on your individual district and how long it takes for people to contact voters, which varies wildly depending on how close people live together. Cool, one last question. Um, and I imagine there will also be some variation wildly <laughs> depending on where you are, but um, uh, Robert over in Hawaii, they do their elections all by mail. Um, so yeah. do you know the percentage of when most people would vote by mail, how you should be thinking about targeting that timeline for GOTV differently given that? Oh, that's a fantastic question. So every state around vote by mail is a little bit different, but most voters vote by mail in the beginning or the end. <laughs> so they either are people who, when they get it, they sort of have an idea of who they're gonna vote for. And um, and good voters tend to be like really voters who vote all the time, they tend to be on that side. And then there's some people who tend to wait till there's a deadline and then try to get it in before the last second, like most humans. So when I'm doing this, I focus my energy on good voters who I know vote every election. I start my vote by mail encouragement with them early in the process. So the, a week before I know that they're gonna get their ballot in the mail, I'll say, hey, your ballot's coming, remember to vote for us, don't forget, vote for us, vote for us. And then I'll call those people when it comes in the mail that day, I'll call the people who vote every election cycle. I will call them first. Those voters who miss elections, who aren't always the best, who, you know, they're not always the greatest voters, I will start with them after I talk to the people who vote all the time because I, you know, the people who vote all the time, they tend to just get it in, get it done quickly, and I want to talk to them early on. So that's how I do it. Um, it might be a little bit different in your place. I will say um, I have worked in Hawaii uh, a little bit on this and that's my experience there. But for all the people on this call or listen later on, your community might be a little bit different and just you'll get to know that or ask somebody who's sort of done it before and they might have an answer for you. Um, well, great. Well, this is my contact info. After every um, after every training I have done, um, someone has contacted me, either emailed me or texted me. I encourage you to do so. I am happy to be a resource for you. For the person who asked where I would buy digital ads, I expect to hear from you so I can tell you my personal answer to that question. I'm sorry. I feel I, I don't want to step out of line uh, for this uh, for the NDTC. Um, for them since I'm just a consultant for them. So I don't wanna say the wrong thing, but um, I'm happy to answer that question. So please feel free to contact me. I'm happy to be a resource for you. If I don't know the answer, I will find somebody who can get you the answer on your state where you are, I can be available. I have worked in like 26 states in my career. So um, I may have even worked in your state and know somebody there. Um, it's been great to get to know you all. And with that, I look forward to um, working with you all very soon. Hi, I'm Sung Chung, a program associate on NDTC Staff Academy team. To keep learning, check out more of our training videos and sign up for our full catalog at traindemocrats.org. Thanks for watching.